Hi, and welcome to the CAFMA Connect. I'm your host, Fire Chief Scott Freitag, and with me today, our special guest, Battalion Chief Brad Davis. Brad, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I love the new ink on the arm for those of you that are watching on the YouTube channel. (laughs) So uh, this week, Brad, you are going to be surprised, and I am going to be surprised because Jonah has something special planned for the podcast, and I think... For those of you who normally listen on podcast platforms, you may want to go to the YouTube channel this week and check it out because I I think this is going to be more of a visual effect. And the idea for this came up originally when uh, Chief Dura was ducking and dodging the podcast and making Fatima come on. Mm -hmm. And they had a port on fire in the city of Prescott. So we were kind of poking fun at that. Um, And then when we did the You Pick It fire, we really got a lot of hits on that and part of that was the video and and chief naminsky talked a lot about how he made decisions yeah right they so we thought hey let's do something similar jonah came up with some ideas i recommended you because you have a good sense of humor uh and i've worked with you on a couple of scenes and i thought you you know what brad would be the perfect guy for this so this is jonah's opportunity to uh get back at me for some of the numerous uh, IT uh, help requests over the last few months. You better believe it. Yeah, that's possible. (laughs) That's possible. And it's his opportunity to get uh, back at me for some of the ideas that I've come up with. One of those, we have a meeting about at 3 o'clock today. One of them is the podcast. And the other one's the (laughs) podcast. (laughs) But we have fun with this. We have fun with it. So, Jonah, take it away. Here's the first one. Okay. Hey, I see one one problem right off the bat. Yeah, they don't have a lot of crews. No. Uh, a, a, uh, a chief officer is pulling supply line off of a truck. Doesn't happen in this area. You know, there's certainly heavy fire in this one, and I'd hit it with a deck gun, Brad. But that's an inside joke between you and I, and. Yes, if we have a hydrant, a deck gun would be would be uh, would be perfect. And and well, Captain Mongo, uh, he understands the deck gun. Yes, yes, he's he's well aware of that. Uh, Clearly, they're in an area where they have a water supply, though. Um, what is that? That's a a brick building. Looks like a garage. Yeah, I couldn't tell the the line that they were on. It's not an inch and three quarter. That might be two inch. Yeah, I think they have a two and a half that they deployed two two for that one. Um, you know, big fire, big water when you have water. Exactly. And then that's the key for us. We're not in the middle of the city where we have a hydrant on every corner. We carry a thousand gallons on the engine. So, um, yeah, if you don't, if you don't have a hydrant, then you do what you can with your thousand gallons until you get water to you. So what's your thought as a battalion chief, you pull up on a structure like this in the middle of Prescott Valley where you have a hydrant, what are you thinking? Um, I'm thinking, I'm hoping they get a water supply. Obviously, life safety is number one. So middle of the day, is that are people inside the building? Do we have a life safety uh, component to that right off the bat? Um, but yeah, uh, that that's going to be an aggressive, hopefully very quick uh, attack. Get that captain to do his 360 around the building. But in the meantime, let's get water on that right away. Right. And checking for exposures. I mean, one of the other challenges that we have here in Prescott Valley, um, not just exposures of homes, but... As we're talking about today, as we're recording, there's a, a significant wildland fire in Flagstaff, and a lot of those embers will travel a long ways on yes. days like this. So we're we're not only thinking of the structure, but we're thinking of the wildland urban interface, even in the middle of Prescott Valley. Yes, right in the middle of town, um, places close together. You think about subdivisions that we have, where they, the houses are real tight and close right. together. We think of uh, mobile home mm-hmm. sections where the houses are real close together. You know, a windy day like this, it wouldn't take much for something to jump from house to house. Yeah. Uh, a, a structure fire that starts in one home moving to two or three. We saw some of those in, in St. Louis from time to time. And I know recently on social media, I've seen some down in Phoenix. So Yeah. And, and you mentioned that the brand's getting thrown, you know, from the fire. That's something that a lot of people don't think about in our wildland urban interface. Yeah, they do their defensible space around the house and stuff. But when you talk about the winds and the brands getting thrown out, it's patio furniture and it's anything else on your back patio, front porch, whatever. There's lots. When you see these places burn in California, 
in some of these places, they're not right up against the wildland, but the winds are throwing those brands out ahead of the fire right. and catching other things on fire or getting into the attic and, you know, through the eaves and stuff of houses. And, and that's a, that's a common occurrence. Yeah. People don't realize how far an ember like that can go and the damage it can cause. So Jonah, back to you, sir. Uh, okay, so can you guys guess what's going to happen? I see a European fire engine. Uh, it looks like we have a petrol truck ahead. So I'm thinking motor vehicle crash, some sort of fire. Okay, I'm thinking that this is the world record. So you decide what the world record is once it's over. Okay. Oh, okay. See... Warning lights on top of the engine for some reason. Something's about to go wrong here. <laughs> I see hazard lights on the car in front of the engine that they're trying to get around. Whoa. Yeah. And now the car's on fire and everybody's bailing out. Response time was yeah. really good, though. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, talk about turnout time, on scene time, real, real, real quick. Response time was great. The good thing is, uh, I don't know what how much water they carry on a European engine, but like you said, we have a thousand gallons, so uh, our folks should be able to knock that out pretty quick with the water that's that's on the engine. Uh, these guys did not get wow. in their gear. Uh, I was hoping to see those, those weird looking uh, European helmets come out, but they don't even have helmets on. So, no, I, you know what the public doesn't realize is that car fires can be some of the most uh, dangerous fires that we fight, not just because of, you know, bumpers that can explode and airbags, but just the carcinogens. Oh, there's lots of a bad, car fire. all the, all the plastics, uh, uh, the fuels and the oils and, and, and what they're, they're made of. Lots of bad stuff that comes right. off of that that we would be protecting our folks uh, breathing air through our SCBAs for sure. Yeah, I, I would rather see them, even though they can knock that fire down pretty quick, get on an SCBA, get your gear on so that nobody gets hurt. The car is already a loss at yep. that point, so protect yourself is, and, and is I, our opinion. You know, one thing too, uh, anything that uh, working on the roadway always concerns me. Um, right, and, traffic. And, whether we're on a car accident, a car fire, uh, like in that video. Um, but that awareness of everything going on around you with traffic and hoping that people see you and you're uh, protecting your, your crew out on the roadway. I've, I've told guys for years that I think, uh, I think sometimes our jobs are a lot more dangerous working on the highway than going into a burning building. Right. Hey, so Jonah, when I was at the Capitol the other day, I actually ran into a lobbyist for the car, car industry car manufacturers, Ford, GM, Chrysler, Ram, all of those. And we were talking about electric vehicles. And I said, he said, well, they're pushing for all electric vehicles by 2040. And my response was, well, I understand that some people think those are better for the environment, but they, no one's told them about trying to do something with the batteries because there's no recycling lithium ion batteries well, right now. Where's all the batteries going to go? So there's nowhere for the batteries to go. But the other part of that, and he was surprised, unintended consequences. I said, we're told that if a Tesla catches on fire, we need about 30,000 gallons of water. There's no guarantee the fire is going to stay out because what they've seen is they dump all the water and then they get it on a, a, a flatbed. It either starts on fire there or several days later at the lot starts on fire. And what, what does that create? But yep. you're also one of our hazmat guys, one of our main hazmat guys. And, and think about... The, the chemicals that are in a lithium ion battery, and now you're washing them down the roadway exactly. with well, 30,000 gallons of water. And those lithium batteries, <clears throat> when, they, uh, when they're uh, overheated, mm -hmm. um, uh, it, like the, the power stuff from APS uh, doing these storage facilities around Arizona too, is that when they, when they go through this, this thing of not, not actually burning but overheating, they put right. off hydrogen gas. Yeah, uh, which is explosive. Uh, which unfortunately, we had a bad incident down in Surprise a couple years ago, um, related to that. Um, but yeah, they're very difficult uh, to deal with. It's not the standard car fire, put it out and, and go home. No. With these fires, I keep forgetting to I forget to mention foam, and I'm going to mention that specifically for uh, Engineer Wagner. He knows how specific I am 
on making sure that guys have foam right mixed in with that water coming out the phone the foam line so uh, there you go adam i had to mention foam foam for you. well and, and when i talked to the gentleman with the car industry i i said think about rural arizona where we are and one six let's call it 169 you have a tesla fire on 169 and you need thirty thousand gallons of water to fight the fire plus you have the potential for a hazard hazardous materials issue because of the runoff um that roadway is not opening up anytime soon, and there's a pretty significant cleanup that goes with that. So, better for the environment. I think people need to to think a little further out and and understand. Yeah, there's a lot uh, a lot to it other than just the I don't have to put gas in my car anymore. Well, and we had the Chevy Volt fire. I don't know if you're. It wasn't a Volt. It was a Bolt or something. Uh, I think it was a Bolt. And we had three investigators on that fire, and two had to miss work because of the noxious gases that they breathed in investigating huh. that fire. So, um, yeah, the, there are a lot of unintended consequences with these things that have not been thought out by folks. I know California said you're not selling anything but electric cars in California in 2030. Um, those guys have not thought those folks have not thought very far ahead about the impact of the environment as a result. I haven't seen a commercial airplane yet that runs on lithium batteries. So I wonder how that transition is going to go. No. And I'm personally not a fan of fire engines that run on the uh, lithium batteries. Think about you picket fire and we're running out of diesel fuel. Yes. So are we going to have to pull a diesel fuel generator up to plug our electric fire engine in so that we can feeding the purpose (laughs) charge the batteries or yeah is the the diesel pump supposed to kick in and charge the the lithium batteries on those things and then we're just going through more so you haven't accomplished anything along with the expense of wiring a station sorry (laughs) tangent jonah let's go what do we got oh i like those cars are you recommending these jonah as the next chief's vehicles yes I want one. I like the yellow one. Just don't be like this guy. I see him. This is interesting. What's he going to do? Well, the other guy in front of him has uh, got a camera out doing a oh. selfie. Uh, well, good. They're going to catch this on video. I can see one of the challenges already is going to be there's a lot of traffic there. How are you going to get through? We're in Dubai. Nope. I don't think you should keep... Oh, there it is. Yeah, it didn't take long to get to that stage, probably. Look at all the video cameras. So, again, we have the carcinogens. Uh, personally, I arrive on scene. I'm in tears seeing a Lamborghini <laughs> on fire, but I'm, I like those. They're cool cars. They are. So what are you thinking? You pull up, engine company? Same thing. Safety is of the crew. Uh, let's get water and foam on it quickly, but full PPE and breathing air. Absolutely. And that is not the time to say anything to the driver of that vehicle about, hey, dude, what were you thinking? Yep. Chalking wheels, too, if it's on any kind of a grade. We've, oh, all, we've good seen point. plenty of uh, videos on social media over the years of uh, right. vehicles on fire that then suddenly start rolling back towards the fire truck or, or whatever. So roll into something else. Make sure they're not going to roll fire. somewhere on you. Yeah. And that would definitely be a B shift day. <laughs> Did I mention Brad is a B shift? Well, yeah. One of the if, if it was a B shift day though, the, the car that's burning would actually get scared and go out on its own once it realizes what shift is on. True. So, yeah. That's possible. All right, Jonah, what do you got for us next? All right. We were in the pool, my friend and I, and we heard an Uh-oh. explosion. Then there was a second Ooh. and a third. One of the uh, other ladies, she said, oh, 78, 79, 80. She was counting them. So then we saw all the black smoke. Propane tanks. And so we were like, There's a oh, yard no, full of propane, propane tanks? Yes, a yard full of propane tanks. US 27 in Sebring. Each explosion was a tank. That's oh, a lot of wow. propane tanks. tanks. Literally exploding. Flying oh, through the air and landing a quarter Jeep mile sure. away in the middle of the highway. Watch as this small propane tank blasts 100 feet in the oh, air. Oh yeah, projectiles, I'm sure. Oh wow, popping off. Uh, so when I arrive on scene and I just call out sick for the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah, this is not going to be good. My first thought is: is 
who is doing the company inspection or who in prevention <laughs> exactly. is yeah. allowing the storage and the and the facility to operate in such a way. <laughs> First in officer, you're picking up the phone call in prevention. Yeah, Chief Chase, I don't know. I think you guys need to go over there and check here? that place out. This is crazy. And, and you know, the funny thing is I've seen this before. I don't know if you have, but in uh, the city of St. Louis, they had a Prax Air facility go up in the middle of downtown <laughs> and li- literally blocks away. Because I've been to, to Maryland. I've been on the East Coast and, and looked at a lot of the Civil War stuff. And, and bear with me for a minute. And you'd see where the cannonball went through the wall of the yes. old brick homes. Uh-huh. I can tell you that a Prax Air bottle can make a very similar hole if it goes straight through like a missile. Yeah, that's uh, that gets real sketchy as far as uh, keeping your crews back. And, yes, and let's get somebody from the facility that ran away to make sure that everyone oh, yeah. got, that everyone got out because we will risk lives to save lives. But uh, they're still but running. We're, we're protecting our people and we're staying back. That's like a surround and drown from a, a distance or, or cool off, I should say. Right, those tanks and and hopefully they're just uh, hopefully a lot of them are just going to vent. And have yeah. the, the valve do what it's supposed to do and vent and just burn up right there. But, I mean, the overpressurizing, you can see what happens yeah. when they start shooting off like that. So. Well, and, you know, people ask, why do you need that aerial platform? Well, if I mean, honestly, we have high rises, not high rises like people think, but we have low rise high rises. We have multi-story buildings. We have garden apartment complexes. We have taller homes offset from the street. But instances like that, safety is a priority and a deck gun isn't necessarily going to hit what you need to hit and i know in st louis they put up some aerials around it and turned them on and well left we'll be back over here Mm -hmm. you know remote control engines think about it brad yeah and since it's like this kind of like a drone you control it from a distance i like that Yes, that's we should yeah. patent that. Nobody take that idea from us. That's yeah. ours. Maybe Carl can work on a drone, own it. a drone for a master stream uh, application of of water. Yeah, drone technology, yeah. remote control access. The, the mean, platform is awesome too. That um, the guys in there, they're, they're, they may be taking on some heat, so they're they're um, having some strain put on their bodies that way. Right, but they can be up there for an extended amount of time. Yes. Um, it's not just 20 to 30 minutes on their bottle and then they got to go down and switch out. They can plug right into the air system on the ladder and remain up there for a while because the ladder has a big bottle on it. Um, so it, we see the extended times too. So there's a, a something if we didn't have that, it'd be crews on the ground with hose lines or deck guns, like you said, right. um, but also having to switch out their bottles constantly. Yeah. So. Well, two things to remember with uh, aerials, and I'll just point this out for your information, Brad, because I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. Not saying where. Uh, one, don't put the ladder in the fire. That's it, probably good advice. It's it's bad for it. <laughs> and two, uh, if you're operating in freezing conditions, I know that's odd for up here, but let's say it's, I don't know, five or below zero. Um, make sure if you have the ladder up that you open the drain uh, because otherwise you can literally freeze a 100-foot aerial platform straight out. Yep. And then you have to have police escort to try to slowly bring it back. And then you put section by section into the building as you work to thaw it, which is time consuming. And I did not do either of these things. They were not my agencies. Um, I'm just sharing some lessons. We, we blew up a ladder pipe on our previous truck company many years ago. Um, shout out to an engineer on my shift. He knows who we're talking about. Where. Uh, it wasn't drained. We have to drain mm-hmm. that before we retract it and bring right. it back down. And that drain wasn't opened. So they tried retracting it while it still had water in it. So um, the valve mm-hmm. to drain that was then named after the person that forgot to do the <laughs> valve. Go figure. Something right. something named after somebody, after they mess something up or break something, we name things after them. So I, I think was I know it a little Davis bit. Light? I know a little bit about that. Yeah, that kind of for, stuff. For the it was a gull wing type door, yes. right? Yes. And uh, it you got to tell the whole story, though, <clears throat> Chief. Not not just. Well, no, we just want pieces. Yeah, not not pieces. just no. no to, but there's so much more to that. Mm-hmm. So brand new what? acting, brand new acting engineer. Okay. Brand new. Um, just signed off recently. Station fifty four around this time of the year, uh, the height of wildland season mm-hmm. is about seven thirty in the morning. And the other crew was not quite there yet for shift change. 
and we got a call for a wildland fire mm -hmm. with exposures. A um, lot of lot of chaos to, and we're we're in that changeover mode in the morning, right? And now we're getting into our wildland gear and getting out of the station. So the acting captain I had that day, um, he kept his wildland boots and pants in the gull wing compartment in the back of the truck. I got on my stuff, hopped in the truck. We opened the garage door. And acting captain jumped in with his wildland pants and boots and said go and didn't check all of my mirrors or the little flashing light that's up there in the cab. Hmm. And I drove out of the station uh, to a huge noise of the gullwing door that was left up after he had grabbed his gear, getting ripped off the truck and it was crumpled up uh, sitting in the uh, sitting on the on the front apron. So. Now nice. those lights were improved after that from a small blinking light to something that gets, gets your attention even more. Um, when people write up issues with that light, it's referred to as a Davis light, not a leave the compartment open light. Right. Press get fire. If they have an issue with that light, it's called the Davis light. So yeah. I've, I've left my uh, mark. With it, that. It, it just spreads out right now. I didn't even get the compartment door for my trophy case oh, at home. Crap. We try to and, save those. And yeah, I never even, uh, the portable radio mm -hmm. I ran over uh, very early in my career. Uh, I have that at home in, in pieces, but yeah, I didn't get the compartment door. So the, the engineer who blew up the ladder, is that person still an engineer? Yes. Okay. Yes. So it wasn't it might, Tharp then? Might be retiring uh, here not too long. So, really? Yeah. Might be out of station 54. Might be on B shift. Could be. I Could just, be. That just I think might I just, be who we're talking about. I just spoke with that uh, <laughs> that particular individual this morning. So yeah. was it the the curry ladder? What did you call it? Oh, uh, that was the valve, the curry valve. Curry valve. Got it. Yeah, the drain, the drain valve on the bottom of the ladder after that incident was called the curry valve. That would make sense. Yeah. Okay, not that we're sorry, calling anybody Bob. Out. I tried to keep it under wraps as to who we were talking about, but hey, there it is. he's retiring <laughs> soon. He's fine. All right, Jonah, what do you got? Oh, nice engine. Yeah, Pierce. we're missing the roto ray on the front grill. No, though. Those not. roto rays are awesome. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. What is that? A it looks like a yeah. electrical pole. So we're not going to be in a huge hurry for water on this particular one. No. Uh. We definitely want to make sure we have some distance between us and that thing. And it looks like, for anybody watching, they might start picking on the uh, engine 3110 there because they're at the end of the line, but it looks like the, the pole that's right by the engine is, that's where the line stops. So there's no lines yeah. above them. But I think they could be, they could probably be a little bit further back, but uh, yeah. On these kind of things, we're looking at uh, stuff around there not catching on fire and basically right. waiting for the power yeah. company to come and uh, come by and uh, de-energize de that because we're not going to, for obvious reasons, we're not going to spray uh, water on something like that. Well, here's the funny thing is that you saw the firefighter, as the clip went away, slowly kind of putting his gear together. And, and a, a passerby may look at that and say, your firefighters were out there. They were not moving. They should have had that thing out. And... That person was doing exactly what they needed to do. Yeah. Power company's not there. That thing's still energized. We're not putting water on it. Therefore, that person doesn't have to be in a big hurry to get their stuff on. Just kind of stand back. And then once it's de-energized, de it's pretty quick to put Some out. Some people will say you can do a short burst and mm -hmm. just shut down the bale. I don't want any water flowing on that and having that electricity chase back down the hose line and, and zap one of our guys. And um, they're can be hazmat in those transformers right. too. A whole other set of issues and stuff that you don't want to get on you. So Well, and let's give a shout out to our local APS, McKenzie, who runs APS for Northern Arizona. Good friend. Um, they, uh, APS is pretty much Johnny on the spot when it comes to stuff like that for us. Yes. Uh, they get out there quick. They de-energize. We put it out. They figure out what happened. But what great partners. Yes, we had the them community. out for those uh, the trampoline into the power lines a couple of weeks ago and they got there right after I did with multiple crews and trucks and and they're they're on top of it. They're, they're fantastic. Yeah, they're they are right on top of things. So uh we had two trampolines, didn't we? Yeah, Within there was one on uh, one one of the other shifts like a day later or No something. kids on them? 
Uh, just trampolines no, flying. Nothing I'm aware of. We have okay, we've thank, gone on those though goodness. too. Yeah. We've had those trampolines take flight in a in a dust devil like that, yeah. and uh, with kids on them and secure yeah, the trampoline good. as best you can. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, the one that we had was a there was a broken tree, um, pieces of roof missing off the one house, so it was quite a dust devil that moved through that neighborhood. Oh yeah. I'm not sure big old concrete stakes on the feet of the trampoline would have done much with that kind of wind, but you can still make every effort to try to, to right. try to, you know, secure that thing down. Right. Okay. Jonah. So oh, the lightning thing real quick, Jonah, I, I've got to give, uh, give uh, props to uh, Jack Dale. Okay. A retired engineer of ours. When I, when I see that, and a lot of guys I work with, when we see a clip like that with transformers burning, Jack was an acting captain one day driving down highway 69 and was going on a, like a lines down kind okay. of a call. And uh, one of those things blew up right in front of them while he was on that radio talking in the middle of his sentence. And he oh, kind of just stopped dead in his tracks and went, we've got a real dangerous situation here. <laughs> and said that on the radio. <laughs> so I hope Jack watches these. Uh, I hope he's one of the 12. Right. Or so no, people that, that watch tens. the, the pod. Ten, the tens, tens of people tens that of watch people. The, the podcast. When John's on, it's fives of the people. <laughs> there you go, Jack Dale. Back All right. Ooh. News here at 630 on a massive fire that continues to burn Holy cow. Pallet yard in Compton. I'm Brandy Hit along with Leslie Sykes. So it's a pallet to yard next to a limo. It looks like limo yeah. bus yeah. yard. Um, so I'm thinking up in this area, we're calling for mutual aid. I'm thinking we better have the cops with us based on what city it's located in. <laughs> but I'm, I'm looking at this. Thinking, no disrespect to Compton, California. That's where my dad's uh, office was. He commuted to, uh, when we lived in California, but, uh, that there's a lot to that. You got, yeah. You got vehicles, you got buildings threatened. It looks um, like power lines. Look at the smoke coming up from some areas a little bit further away, uh, off to the right, at least as I'm looking at it on the screen. And a fence on fire, because that, that does happen. That right there would empty CAFMA, PFD, and, and some of the smaller surround. That, that would empty everything we have that would activate county mutual aid. That's a big event for us. And and may go to statewide because if you think about it, look at the, and even with that, look at the water issues we would have. Yes. <laughs> Do we even have enough water in the, the Prescott Valley system to flow for something like that? And that's consideration as communities develop is, hey, do you have the water resources in order? If you're going to put this in, here's the potential. Mm -hmm. uh, because with that, you're looking at debt guns, you're looking at aerial platforms, you're looking at hours and days and hundreds of firefighters that are needed uh, to deal with that. Yeah, it, it, I mean, you just flowing one platform, depending on the neighborhood, could be enough to where people don't have right. enough water to flush their toilets because we're flowing one aerial device because it takes that much uh, uh, water out of the system. So as a battalion chief, give me your size up when you pull up My on that. My size up on that? Um, well, I'm going to tell somebody to call 911. Lean, <laughs> oh, wait, lean, lean towards wait, the mic. We, we are we are 911. Um uh, that kind of, yeah, d depend on what, where I approach it from, but, um, that would be very hard to get real specific. Right. Um, just multiple vehicles, multiple commercial structure structures involved or threatened. Right. And it would be, uh, you know, getting as many resources there, bumping up how many alarms of, of apparatus I need. Um, I don't think that we have enough alarms to yeah, fill the alarms. That one would be real crucial for the first, uh, first in officers to do what they can to set it up for success by establishing a staging area and really getting the incident command system in place so that there's order to what's going right. on because that could be very chaotic with freelancing and people coming in from all different directions. You got to do what you can to maintain order of your resources. Yeah. So. And you may want to set that up kind of like a wildfire event just because Absolutely. of the different areas. Um, you know, a, a good resource for that. And let's talk about that real quick. Captain Postula, this is for you. Um, drone technology. I just saw a social media yes. post with Phoenix Fire. Um, Carl, I apologize, but Phoenix does have better drones than we do currently. Currently, I was going to say, Chief, you you can do something about we're, that. We're trying. Well, I have to get the money, but um, that would be drone technology right there out of the BC vehicle, where you can launch that, and then as the battalion chief, 
you're in your vehicle looking real time up above and to that see would be everything it, you're yeah you with. get 360 degrees you can see speci more specifically what is burning and where your hotter areas are kind of like on the on the you picket they were able to yeah. determine where to aim the streams on where their hotter uh, pockets were within that uh, little pile of cars right. three stories high i think yeah yeah um but drone technology uh right. that would be great for that for something like that to help the incident commander you guys keep stealing my thunder so next video here oh here we go okay so ready ready let's go whoa oh my that's gosh. nasty tractor trailer tires uh it looks like it's spotted a little further out Starting into the wildland. Uh, this time of the year, I'm very concerned about that getting into the into the wildland. There's some wind blowing that thing. Those larger fires, like any fire, it's about displacing those BTUs, and there is so much heat coming off of that um, that you're just you're not going to just pull up with a deck gun and, and put that out. Um, that's going to be no, very but you could pull up time deck consuming. Gun. Tell 58 B shift. Tell hey, Mongo, Mongo hit it with the yeah Mongo hit it with let's the hit it with a deck gun. Chief, I only have a thousand gallons of water. <laughs> I know. Hit it with the deca, because we're going to be out of the thousand gallons pretty quick. I. But honestly, like if this happened today in our red flag conditions that we're currently in today, um, uh, you know, I I would be really really worried about that getting out into the grassland and and running running on us. What would you say our, our winds are gusting to today? Um, according to my little app at home, it was it was sustained around twenty three. So I would assume it's gusting over thirty. Yeah. And with this, I mean, you're really looking at trying to just surround to protect the areas around it because you're not going to put it out. I mean, that's clearly in an area where there's no water. Now, here's the thing, though. We're going to get calls asking why we have not put this fire out yet because yep. it's bothering some people. <laughs> so, But one of the things we want to look at is if there's communities in the way of that, that smoke downwind, almost like a, a hazmat, you, you might yes. go in and say we're going to evacuate the area because the air quality yep. are protecting place. But exactly. Tell people to shut their doors, shut their windows, and, and seal up, or or actually evacuate. Um, you know the black smoke too. That uh, we talk about pr protecting our crews and what they're breathing. Right. You know we're not going to put people on hoses. You know or, or working on their off their engines in areas where they're going to get in the middle of right. all that for. for for no reason. Um, and the problem with being out in front of that, even on the wildland side, is because you've got, you can't have people work a fire line in full gear when you're dealing with wildlands. So you're just kind of monitoring where is that going. And then uh, Carl gets to play with his drone again. Yes. His new upgraded drone that he deserves but doesn't have. And I don't know when he'll have it. But we're taking donations. All right. Here we go. Last one. Speaking, All right. Here we go. Speaking of hazmat. Hazmat. Oh, great. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, there's there's definitely some hazmat. That's, the blue water is, is hazmat in, in those things. Dude, there's a whole row of those things. Yeah. This is the best part. You spray this for about five seconds, and then you just watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm done. He got a whiff of something when one of those doors came open. <laughs> nope. I'm out. Yeah, there's team, a lot of different ways to describe that type of fire, but that we can't really say on the podcast that True. i'm sure pulling up in the truck or after the get back to the station that guys would have some choice uh, ways to describe what type of a call that was and just a reminder it's not just on the podcast brad that we would caution how we give a size up on that but for those of you in the engine we would caution how you give that size up over the air <laughs> we we are uh you know we do have fcc regulations on what you can yes. say yes. i know what you want to say Tact, uh, tactful and professional tactful. on the radio. Is that City of Prescott by chance? Kind of like I saw the gazebo. It looked. It, it's actually uh, in Louisiana, but it looked very, very similar. It was it, Mardi Gras. Oh, oh, that can't be good. Oh, hopefully, they're popping some doors and making sure there's not people, <laughs> yeah. people in some of the other ones too. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. We have to still might have a life safety issue. You have exposures. You may have people passed out in the Port of Johns. I mean, if it's Mardi Gras. Yeah, um, I've been to New Orleans, not for more Mardi Gras, but uh, uh, that can be an interesting place sometimes. Yeah. Forcible entry into Porter Johns. I, I think our crews would be able to handle that. I don't think they want to. I don't think they want to, but yeah, they, I they, mean, they would. Needs to get done. They would, but <laughs> they wouldn't. We'd be looking for a lot of 
uh, probationary firefighters. Hey, yeah. go practice the, forcible the, entry. The runoff wouldn't be really, uh, really good either. What would you do for hazmat with that? Would you dike it just to keep all the? We would probably do what we could to keep it out of the water system or the, or the drainage. And yeah, the, the 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 low guy on the totem pole <laughs> right. would be the one uh, tasked with uh, getting out there and uh, and doing that. But. It gives gives new meaning to uh, decon and some of these things. Wash the s off your boot. Yeah. Um, no, seriously, it's do you have a big clump yep. there? You know, brown trout floating down the gutter i mean that's dangerous gosh i mean i i don't i would not be want to be bitten by one of those things especially no, at mardi gras no corn-eyed bass they'll, they'll, corn -eyed they'll, bass. Hurt, they'll hurt, you, hurt you too Just watch, watch out if he is so I walk away. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I don't get the little short burst of water and then just, then he just says, uh, well, we're done. <laughs> yeah. Let's hit the but showers, it, boys. <laughs> it didn't even, it looked like he had a garden hose. That wasn't a fire stream. It's like he took a garden yeah. hose because it was there and I guess they're still waiting for water. But that, um, we've gone on those on fire and they, they burn really, really quick. They they, they do. Go and go up very quick. Here's the thing with Porta Johns catching on fire is it's not common because well, quite frankly, there's no electric in them. There's no real reason for them to catch on fire unless somebody lights them on fire. So from yes. what my research, fireworks in a port john is a thing. And that's when a lot of the fires come Really? Out, is from people setting off fireworks in the port john But, well, you know, they do put them in toilets sometimes. But, ugh. I mean, I don't want to go in. I don't like port johns just down at a fair when I have to use the restroom. <laughs> exactly. And I certainly didn't care for it when we were building our house. Those things were nasty. Yeah. Can you imagine we, that? When we had, when our neighbor built his house, random people driving down the street would stop and use the porta john. Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't like know what's FedEx in there. Guy, the FedEx guy would stop and use the porta john. Well, you know what? It's perfect for FedEx, UPS, Amazon drivers because they're out and it's like, there's not really a restroom for them. Yeah. And especially out where you and I live right now, Brad, on the outskirts of town, if you're FedEx delivery out there, man, you got to do something. Well, yeah, it's not like you're going to put a package on somebody's porch and then go, you know, behind a bush in their front yard. Like yeah. You've got to find a, an appropriate facility. Well, so. And, and so here's something for you. <laughs> um, just real quick before we close it out this week, Brad. So there were some firefighters pulled up to a, a person who calls frequently. Um, this is a cautionary tale about ring doorbells. Um, the engineer had gotten up in the middle of the night and had to go use facilities, but couldn't because they had to run on the call. And so since he had a little time at the front door, he watered a plant, which was caught on the ring doorbell. Yeah, there's cameras everywhere Yeah, just in to, today's just world. Assume, so. Just assume you're on camera. Yes. So, yes. Jonah, that was fun. I enjoyed it. Those were some good fires and some good, uh, good opportunity for discussion and good opportunity for research. I know that uh, you said the podcast was you're getting even with me for that. But I mean, look at the research you put into it and the quality product you put out. <laughs> so, Brad, I appreciate you coming in. No going problem, through this Chief, with us. Anytime. That was uh, that was fun. Something a little bit different. Again, if you're listening on one of the podcast platforms, probably better if you go to our YouTube channel, because that way you can see. Uh, the incidents that Jonah put up there for us. Um, but until next week, please don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Be one of the tens of people who tune in <laughs> the to tens see of people. exactly what we might do uh, on this podcast within the bounds of you know being a, a district. And yes, we do say some things from time to time, but that's okay. We have fun and we're here for you and we are here to uh, educate and provide information. So next week we'll do more of that. Brad, again, thank you. Jonah, as always, awesome. Uh, have a great week.